me write it in the chat or um, feel do you want people to unmute or ask wait till at the end how do you want to do this let's wait till at the end sally because okay. i have a lot of material i'll save some time at the end so we can answer the questions otherwise we might get off track and then i won't be able to get things accomplished okay can everybody hear phil i'm gonna it's so loud outside here i'm gonna mute me, me too <laughs> okay so welcome phil we were just we were chatting those that just got on he has 49 acres outside of well outside of pittsburgh you know, from pittsburgh um and so phil is going to be our resident expert gardener would be front farmer so i will turn it over to phil and as I said, if you have questions, feel free to write it in the chat room towards the end. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Sally, and thanks everyone for participating. I'm gonna start a, a slide presentation here so we can, and uh, Okay, so we're, we're the plant-based Pittsburgh group. And this is the agenda here that we're going to be following. Like I said, there's a lot of material here. And I apologize to those that have had a lot of gardening experience. Um, some of this is for fairly basic. So I, I didn't want to go into too much detail because we have a, a limited amount of time. And as Sally mentioned, if we can hold the, our questions and comments to the end, that would be helpful. So I've been in the plant-based lifestyle for now for 11 years. Well, I'm almost 12, I guess, in September. And I'm a member of the East Pittsburgh, the Pittsburgh East group. And my gardening experience, I started out as a, in a young age working with my parents. We always had a vegetable garden and my mom had flower beds and, uh, I work with them and, and probably that's what probably got me along this line. Now I've had my own gardens for quite a period of time here now. Uh, I'm just experienced with uh, certain groups of vegetables and some flowers um, that, uh, that I've grown in the past, but uh, I am no way or shape uh, an expert and I'm sure many of you that have had different experiences uh, will have expertise that you can contribute to the discussion later on. One of the aspects I like uh, about gardening is um, this little slide here talks about losing your mind and then finding your soul in, in the garden. So what are the benefits of gardening? Well, first of all, it's high quality food. I mean, you know, you, you buy those things called tomatoes in the store and they're really not tomatoes. I mean, they've been, they've been bred for transport and tough skins to make them easy to be picked. And uh, if you look at the criteria that, that's used by the farmers is basically taste is like the last one on the list. So, uh, and then there's nothing like, you know, having uh, picking some sweet corn and, and walking and putting it in on a pot. And you'll never get it any sweeter than that because as, as uh, time goes by after you pick sweet corn, it's, the sugar starts to turn to, to starch. Also, you get a lot of exercise. Uh, and I find that out every spring. I'm using a whole set of muscles that I hadn't used all winter long. And uh, it's, it's good exercise, good to be outside. Also, it gives you an opportunity to, to to enjoy nature and meditate a little bit and relax. I find gardening very relaxing. And I take the opportunity to, to get some sun while I'm out there. Uh, I'll, I'll take my shirt off for 15 or 20 minutes and get a little bit of vitamin D. So those are some of the benefits that I see from gardening. Now, this is a, a photo of my garden. Um, the rows along here are 125 feet long and about 60 feet wide and this tragus bed here you can see it just uh, going to seed this was from a couple years ago 
uh, and it's about um, 35 feet, 40 feet long. And then I've grown some corn in here, and uh, these are all potatoes down here. Um, and I've got leafy greens. I grow a whole variety of leafy greens, kale, Swiss chard, uh, and I grow squashes. And then I grow a lot of, a lot of tomatoes. Uh, I can them and I, I freeze them. And these are my tomatoes down here. And I also like to grow flowers. My wife and I, we enjoy them. And these are some of our lilies. And we have, I would prefer to turn my whole lawn into flower beds, but I can't manage to do that yet. But uh, I enjoy the flowers much more than cutting the grass. So let's talk a little bit about starting seeds. And it gives you the option for more varieties. I mean, you can go to the big box stores or some of the garden centers and find some common varieties of tomatoes and, and different peppers and things like that. But when you, when you start your own, but from the seed, you get to pick and choose. You can try the most flavorful. Uh, like I like to grow San Marzano tomatoes from, to make tomato sauce with. And uh, they're not commonly found uh, in many of the greenhouses. And so I, I start my own. So it gives you some, and, and you save a little bit of money. It's, it's, uh, it, it can save some money. Uh, in terms of rather buying the starter plants and starting your own. Uh, basically what I do is, you know, try to figure out back how long it takes to germinate and give an idea of how, how big the plants will be from my last frost date. And that's how I'll calculate when I'm going to start seeding. It also gives you the opportunity to save seeds and, and reuse them from the following year. And uh, I've seen some people that, that at, toward the end of the year, they let their plants go to seed and then just kind of pull them out and put them in a shed over the winter. And then when the spring comes, they can just pull off the seed heads uh, off of the plants and, uh, and use them to replant with. I start my seeds inside with, uh, with grow lights. And um, you can use inexpensive shop lights. I wouldn't recommend getting the least expensive type of light because the ballast in them do not last real long. Get the, if you go buy them, buy like the mid-range the mid-range light um, and uh, it'll be a little bit better. There are also LEDs that have full spectrum and I, I've not done anything with them. They're a lot more expensive. I think the fluorescent lights are, are, are the least expensive way to go, but uh, there, are no, there are another alternative uh, which is becoming more popular. One of the things that, that, that I use is a rope ratchet hanger. And um, when uh, to hang, to support the lights, you need to raise them and lower them. Every time you water the plants, you gotta raise them. And, and this becomes a problem in trying to tie the lights off. And um, so these little gadgets work really well. Uh, you, you pull on a cord and it, and it ratchets up and and it holds it in place. And then when you're done, you just flip a tab and you lower it right down to the length that you like to have it lowered. As far as bulbs are concerned, some of the recommendations that I've seen are, you wanna have something like 15,000 to 2,000 lumens and uh, the temperature between 4,500 and 6,000 Kelvins. So that gives you the type of light, whether it varies from cool to, to warm. And, and so this is the range that they say it's the optimum. Myself, the lights that I've had have, I'm using just the economy fluorescent bulbs and they work. And I mean, I've, I've, I've grown plants with them. Uh, and they recommend like 16 hours a day on, I have it on a timer and then eight hours off. And you should adjust your, your lights to keep them about one or two inches above the plants. You can also use temperature controlled heating pads to give a, your, your seeds a jump start, keeping them warm. And these things are not too expensive if you, you like to use them. I personally have not used them, but, but many people do. Um, when, I, when I plant the seeds, I usually use two or three seeds per cell so that because sometimes you, know, you don't get 100% germination, you can always thin them out. Uh, if you have too many growing there. 
and don't plant them too deep. You can, like the very small seeds, uh, like the broccoli seeds and some of the others, yeah, I put them just on the surface and just give uh, the seed, the potting medium before I plant the seeds. Otherwise, then you start washing things around when you go add water later on. And it's also important to make sure that whatever containers you're planting them in have water drainage so that you don't get rotting once, once the seeds start to grow. One thing you like to do is harden the seed seedlings off before planting. And um, why do we do that? Well, the sun and, and the wind will, will, will burn the plants. And uh, ultraviolet uh, is the problem, so they have to get them conditioned to that. Uh, and it thickens the leaves up so that, um, you know, you, you retain uh, moisture and you don't get as much transplant shock. You know, when you, when you put those tender seedlings out there, um, they're, they're susceptible and uh, they'll, they'll get set back a little bit. So hardening off helps that. And it also gets them exposed to the wind a little bit so that they can start to develop a little bit stronger stems once they get out in the garden. And there's several different proposals on how to do to harden plants off. Some people say put them out for one hour a day over seven days, some say three days of overcast all day long, um, or three to four hours a day gradually by increasing one to two hours a day. There's several different approaches there and you can try whatever suits you. Um, I'll show you my setup here. Uh, basically, I, I, I plant in, in the six packs uh, and uh, I have eight six packs per tray times four trays. So I have 192 cells when I'm starting, starting my seeds. And I have them on a, on a shelf with a rack with two shelves. Now these are the, the rope ratchet hangers that I mentioned. Um, they're like six or seven bucks a piece. Um, they're not very expensive and you can just pull down on the rope and the ratchet holds it and then you push the button and you can lower it down very easily. So it makes it very convenient. Um, this is my setup here where I've got a couple lights and on, on the two shelves. And you can see I angled this one down to show like my tomatoes were getting high on this side. And then so I, if I have some herbs on the other end, I can get the light closer to that source. Uh, so it's very convenient. I mean, you can do this by tying the ropes off, but it's a pain and, and the ratchets really make it much simpler. So let's talk a little bit about soil. And this is the foundation of gardening. It's all, it all goes to the soil. And it's a living organism and it is very complex. And soil fertility involves physical, chemical, and biological aspects. And there's all these organisms in this microbial biomass. Um, fungi is a very important one. It sends threads out and, and helps the soil structure. Uh, there's different protozoan type uh, material in there. There's bacteria, viruses, there's single celled uh, material. There's a whole variety of things in there that are alive in that soil. And the main thing that these microorganisms do is decompose organic matter. And this is the most important thing that, uh, in getting uh, nutrients to the plant because it, in, the, in their process of decomposing this organic matter, uh, they free up nutrients for the plant to use. So that's a fundamental, fundamental thing in gardening. They also fix nitrogen. They can detoxify some harmful chemicals. They suppress disease organisms and then they, they stimulate the plant growth, which we, which we want to see. Uh, pH is a measure of uh, how acid or basic your soil is. And the lower the number is, it's, it's more on the acid side, the higher is alkaline and seven is neutral. And the number we like to shoot for is around 6.5 uh, for home gardeners. There are some acid loving plants that like lower pH and, and there's a whole list of them here. I mean, the little blueberries do and hydrangeas and uh, some of the evergreens, azaleas. And there's also some plants that like it more on the basic side. When you say you put more lime in to adjust your soil, if you're doing clematis or butterfly bushes or mock orange and so forth. 
So how do you know what your pH is? You can test for it. Uh, Penn State, for those in Pennsylvania, you can uh, go to the Agricultural Extension Service and uh, ask them to send you a test kit. They will send you a bag. We'll take a soil sample. You can take three or four different uh, samples and then mix them together within your, so you get a representative sample of your garden. You can also buy test kits in some of the garden centers. Uh, but Penn State will come back with an analysis and, and tell you how much lime or whatever you need to adjust uh, your soil for the crops that you're growing. Soil is made up of a lot of different particulates and, and these are the three main ones, sand, silt, and clay. And the optimum, which is like 40% sand, 40% silt, and 20% clay, which is defined as loam. And uh, so that's what you see in your good topsoils. And um, how can you tell? Well, you have, you can do a squeeze test, uh, pick up a handful of it, and give it a squeeze, rub it between your fingers. If you have clay soil, it'll stay tightly balled and it'll feel very slippery. Sandy feels kind of gritty and crumbles. And if you've got loam, it'll, it'll hold its shape and crumble a little bit, but stay loosely balled. If your soil isn't loamy and you want to amend it, then get amend it with some, get take some get some topsoil and also add some organic material to that to uh, to make it better for fertility. Compost is called black gold. I mean, it's it's for if you're an organic gardener, compost is really the ticket, and you can compost just about anything. Uh, for, uh, from the plant, plant kingdom, uh, also uh, cardboard and newspaper, uh, yard waste, animal manure and twigs. And what I like to do when I build a compost pile is, is try to place this in layers. It's not always possible, but depending upon how you get your materials. I mean, after I cut the grass and I've got a lot of grass clippings, uh, sometimes I'll redistribute the pile a little bit and try to sep uh, segregate that a little bit and mix it up. Um, people talk about green and brown ratios uh, in, in terms of the amount of um, nitrogen in the green material that you put in a compost pile versus the amount of carbon. Uh, and it can, it, Get very complicated and basically what I suggest is use what you have. Um, there's different types of composting. Uh, uh, you can use a, a hot compost by by wetting it down really good and rotating it and, and turning it over more frequently and you can get compost in a month or you can do a cold composting style where you just put that stuff in there and maybe just turn it over once or twice over the whole six month period and then it takes a while. But keeping it moist is important, but not too moist because composting is an, 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 uh, an aerobic process. If you add too much water, it might go anaerobic. We have no oxygen and it will get slimy and stinky. But if you, you, you have just enough water in there that you can squeeze it and you get, just to get a couple of drops, um, then that's good. When you turn it over, you don't want the temperature to go be beyond 130 or 100, 160 F, uh, because if it gets too hot, I mean, you want to get in this range here to kill the weed seeds. That's an important thing, because you can compost weeds and all kinds of things as long as you kill the seeds. And, um, but if it gets too hot, uh, it can destroy some of the microbiome that you want to, that you want to integrate in, into your garden. So. Uh, and, a, and a good alternative for the people in suburban areas, I mean, for me, I have a pile up by an outbuilding and that's not a problem, but in, in suburban areas, it's a little more difficult to do that, it would be vermiculture and composting with worms. And uh, it's a pretty cool thing. You can just take your garden scraps, your newspaper, and put them in, a, in a, uh, a bin, a plastic bin and feed these worms and the worm castings are very, very good, very, very good fertilizer and uh, a structural amendment to the soil. I had planned to do this with my grandkids this summer because we usually watch them over the summer, but uh, 
This year we were not able to do that, maybe next year. Mushroom compost uh, is the spent compost that's used to grow mushrooms in. And even though it's spent for mushroom growth, it's uh, still very good for gardening. And um, it can be made from a variety of, of organic materials. And there are some inorganic materials like urea, which is an ammonium, uh, made from ammonia and ammonium nitrate. Um, but this is good stuff and it, it works very well. Um, you know, urea, cottonseed, and chicken manure provide most of the nutrients available to the plants. Uh, but commercial uh, mushroom growers, they compost it to 160 and then pasteurize it at 140. Now, there are one issue with, with uh, mushroom compost that there can be some soluble salts in there uh, that might be too concentrated for germinating seeds in young plants. So, um, I, I would suggest testing if you buy um, mushroom compost, test it on a, on, a, on a couple container garden things before you use it, and that way you'll know if it's a problem. Um, if, what I'm planning to do is to start a new bed in the fall and then let it sit uncovered over the winter and then the rain will come and dissolve those soluble salts and uh, then it shouldn't be a problem seeding directly right into that or uh, transplanting uh, the young seeds from the plants that I started in the, in the house. But uh, if you look at, at economically, it's very, uh, very reasonable uh, like I, I bought a yard of mushroom compost, a cubic yard, for $37. And that's approximately 2,000 pounds. Now, uh, to replace that, like with miracle Grow raised bed soil, uh, it would cost me $144. So uh, if, you do, if you do that comparison, um, it's economically very advantageous to, to use mushroom compost. And you can... Uh, most, a lot of the landscape places carry it, especially in Pennsylvania here where we grow a lot of mushrooms. Now, or you can buy it in bags, which then is a little more expensive. But if you can buy it in bulk, you can save a lot of money. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a good way to go. And here's a couple uh, different views of composting setups. Um, people like to use skids uh, like this, and it's good because it has some air uh, inlets because the way the skids are built and they put it in a pile till it's filled and they turn it over into the next one and keep putting new material in here and let this break down and then they add to that and then finally uh, get it in the last bin there when the last stage is uh, before it's ready to go into the garden. And this is the pile here that I just started um, and basically it's grass clippings uh, and you see I put a lot of leaves or uh, twigs in and, and uh, cuttings in there. These are some hydrangea cuttings that I took off of my hydrangea bushes to separate some of the material to let air ingress in there. And mostly it's grass clippings and my paper towels and any, any carbon source. Leaves are excellent if you can get them. Uh, the only thing I would suggest if you're using grass clippings, be very careful where you get them from. Uh, if you're using your own lawn and you think about that, uh, if people sometimes treat their lawns and with uh, insecticides and uh, herbicides and uh, it will kill your vegetables. So you, you want to make sure that that's not a problem. Fertilizers, a couple classes we'll look at as chemical fertilizer. Uh, basically these are petroleum products and rock dust and things like ammonium phosphate, sulfate and nitrate uh, you'll find in them. Urea is a very common one and, and ammonium ammonium chloride. The ammonia compounds are where you get your nitrogen from. And so when you buy a bag of fertilizer, there's some numbers on the front of it and, and it will list this nitrogen phosphorus potassium ratio. Like if you buy a, a bag of 10, 20, 20, and that's a little bit strong. I like to use 10, 10, 10 when I was using, when I use it in my garden. Uh, but this is 10% nitrogen, 20% phosphorus, and then 20% potassium. And the phosphorus is in the, in the form of phosphorus pentoxide and the potassium is potassium oxide. And the advantage is it's affordable, affordable uh, 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 40 pound bag will cost like 12 or $13. It's fast acting. So the stuff, you know, the nutrients get to the plants very quickly. 
standard labeling so you know exactly what you're getting. This advantage is it's not environmentally friendly and it's a non made from a non-sustainable product. It can leach into water sources. That's probably not an issue for a home gardener, but in the farms, it is a major issue, like in the Chesapeake Bay and there's different places like that where the, the stuff runs off. And manufacturing, it does consume a lot of energy and it doesn't improve the soil structure. And you have to put it on periodically. And you have to be careful because it's easy to over fertilize and damage the soil ecosystem and your plants. I mean, you, you, can, you can kill your plants if you put too much fertilizer on at one point in time. And you can get a toxic buildup over time. I, again, I don't think that's so much of a problem for home gardeners, but you, you, this happens. It might alter the pH of the soil uh, because of some of the ammonia compounds uh, it might make it a little more acidic and you may have to readjust with some lime. And there's some heavy metals uh, in there. And, I, I, and one of the things I was not aware of that some, some uh, chemical fertilizers have uranium and I've never heard of that before, but it was noted. But I, the amount of uh, Heavy metals, I think, is pretty small. And I mean, we, we can get heavy metals from uh, just about a lot of the things we ingest, even from rice and some of the other grains we eat. <laughs> now on the organic side, it's uh, basically natural and retains that form. Uh, plant animal waste, fish emulsions, manures, cotton seed and bone meal, and then compost, which, is great and powdered minerals and there's there's a lot of uh, discussion right now I've, I've been reading some articles about these powdered minerals how soluble they are and how effective they are I haven't really made up my mind on them I know uh, some of the people that I've watched uh, in some of the, the plant growing videos on growing really good tomatoes use uh, a rock rocks uh, phosphate uh, material but it does enhance the nutrient profile of the, and soil structure and it has good water retention because your, uh, your, your tilled soil will pack down and uh, compost, you can, it, it'll absorb that water. It's very slow release. That's one of the things I, I, I've noticed this year that I'm, I'm using mushroom manure on my, on my plants. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, that it, it, it is a lot slower release, but there's no harmful acids or salts. And it's, since it's slow and uh, depending upon the ratio of stuff you got in your organic material, the effect on this can vary and it requires warmth and moisture. And it, it, it is expensive. Now, um, a lot more expensive than chemical uh, fertilizers, but you know, the, there's advantages and disadvantages there. Now I'm trying this uh, organic fertilizer, this Neptune Harvest Tomato and Veg Concentrate this year on my tomatoes and some of my other plants. I watched this fellow from California Garden TV and he had a, a lot of good uh, information. He grew some tremendous uh, volumes uh, using this stuff. So it's a foliar spray. You just spray it on the leaves uh, once every other week. Uh, and you use a, you can, it's a concentrate, so you mix up an ounce per gallon. It's about $35 for a quart, but it makes 32 gallons. So it'll last you the whole season. I'm gonna see how that goes and what the results are. And this is what's in it, a fish emulsion, seaweed, molasses, yucca extract, and humic acids uh, that are, take, they take hot water and run it through compost and manures and, and uh, take this stuff out and then uh, use it as a, a benef benefit to the plants. And so you can see the, the very low NPK, it's 242. So it's a lot slower, it's a lot easier on the plants in terms of uh, the concentration. So a couple types of way we can approach making a garden, we can till it or we can no-till. And tilling breaks up the hard soil, gets the nutrients down inside, and, and it's good if you have a lot of weeds and, and clover or whatever on top of the soil, it incorporates them in. It, it warms up the soil in the spring so the seeds get more stimulated and, and it builds up the aerobic bacteria, gets air in the soil. Uh, also disrupts some of the larvae and insects that have wintered over in the soil. It can kill sprouting weeds, but it also wakes up those weed seeds that are by the billions in, in, the, in the soil and 
cause them to sprout. So there's a double-edged sword there. And it may cause erosion if your ground is not fairly level. And you lose, you know, the soil dries out once you once you turn it over, and you can lo you lose a little bit of nitrogen, and it creates a hard pan. Like if you have a rototiller uh, that's set for six inches, and you till that every year, you're only going down six inches, and that it becomes compacted underneath that six-inch level, where the roots then of the plants have a hard time penetrating to get more nutrients. And there's some expense in getting equipment. You either got to pay somebody to do it or do it yourself, or you can use a broad fork, and I, I did that when I first started out gardening. Uh, there's a big long fork, you step on it and turn it and turn it over. Uh, if you're going to buy a rototiller, I would recommend one of those older Troy Bills, not the new ones, the, 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 the MTD manufacturers now, they're nowhere near the quality of these old ones, but they're made out of steel, they have bronze gears. I have one that I bought in 1973, and uh, the motor just conked out on it. Uh, and uh, and so I was still using it. So it's, it's, it's they're great machines. They're very well made. No-till conserves moisture, minimizes weeding. And, and weeding is probably, you know, 80% of the time we spend in gardening and weeding. It just becomes such a problem. Uh, and it helps a healthy soil, improves the yields. Uh, and uh, I've seen some videos from Charles Dowding and Richard Perkins uh, they're market gardeners, and it just amazes me the yields that they can get out of very, very small areas, and and uh, minimizes erosions, and you got to require some mulching. If I were starting a garden now, this is what I would do: I would lay cardboard on the ground or build a raised bed. And I would put eight or ten inches of compost in it, and I would go from there. Watering. Better to water in the early morning or late afternoon. Uh, you should direct the water to the base of the plants. Try to avoid splashing on the leaves. This, this is more of a problem in, when uh, later in the season or when it gets very humid and you don't have a lot of air movement, you can get mildews and molds and different things on your plants. Uh, I haven't had much of a problem with this, but it's something to consider. Um, the amount you use depends on the growth stage. I mean, when plants are young, they haven't developed good root systems yet, to absorb water, so you have to water them more frequently or, or they will get set back, slow down, or even die if you don't water them enough. And depending upon the depth of the roots, uh, like shallow rooting plants like peppers, uh, you may want to water them a little more frequently. And I plant my tomatoes pretty deep, and, and so I, I give them a little more water too. But you want to try to develop a feel for you don't use too much or too little. And you want to look to see if the leaves are wilting or yellow. And, and, you, and if you're doing, working compost or you've got your soil pretty well broken up, you can put your finger in it. It will always be dry on the surface, but you can feel if there's some moisture down there. And, you, you know, you may not want to use as much water. Uh, but when, the, when you're growing your tomatoes and your uh, peppers, when they're starting to fruit, you definitely want to increase the water levels. Uh, drip irrigation is a great way to do it, and I would recommend anybody using this. It's, it's, I just put one in uh, over the weekend, and it's fairly easy to do. And um, they have these drip emitters. You put them on, you punch a little hole in a hose, you put it in, and it just emits the water out uh, at a certain rate. And you can buy them uh, from 0.5 gallons per hour up to six gallons per hour, at least the small ones, and then the bigger ones go up from there. You can also get soaker hoses and sprinklers, and these are great. You can put them on a timer, and if you want to go away for the weekend or for a couple of weeks on vacation, you, you know, the, these will work for you while you're gone. And uh, the ones that I bought, I did a little research on them. I bought the Netafilm Woodpecker Juniors, and a lot of the vineyards use them. And they're high quality. They're pressure compensated so that they, the uh, ones at the end of the line will get the same amount as the ones in the front of the line. There's an orifice in there and there's a, a valve that opens based on pressure <clears throat> and it will give you the equidistant or equal, equal amounts. <clears throat> Here's an example of an emitter. <clears throat> Have a little punch tool. You just punch a hole and slip this in. This is a little bit bigger than a dime. It's fairly small. Now this one is, is generating a lot of water. Mine just come out a drip at a time because I've got the 0.5 gallon per hour uh, emitters. <clears throat> and this is a soaker, hole, soaker hose. It has um, 
plastic inserts in it with, that restrict the water flow to certain amounts. And uh, the one that I bought, the, it, it was generating too much water, so I put a valve in the line to slow that water down. Uh, but those, those are working great now. I've, I've watered my plants within the last few nights. It just saved me a lot of time. Uh, weeds are the bane of all gardeners. Like I said, probably 80% of our time ends up being involved with them. And as the temperature rises, they grow exponentially. And I, I will tell you that sometimes at the end of July and in August, I'm out there weeding with my string trimmer because they've gotten ahead of me. And so how do we control them? Hoeing is the most common way. Uh, you can either chop them out and bury them. And, I, and what I do, like, like if I have a row crop like corn that I'm growing in my garden, I will bury the weeds between the plants. It's just too hard to get at them in between, in between the plants. So I, I uh, kind of hoe the, 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 the soil up onto the uh, mound of, and uh, build the corn plant up. You can also mulch. And I've used all of these. Uh, I've used plastic and cardboard. And grass clippings are great mulch because they, they uh, pack down and make a very tight layer and uh, keep the weeds from going down. Wood chips are good. Landscape cloth is a plastic cloth that's woven and uh, it'll let water through. Uh, and uh, it's good. I mean, I've used this. Uh, for uh, when I was growing um, a, a different vining plants like cucumbers and squashes, because it's hard to weed between them once they really get going, unless you trellis them. If you trellis them, that's not an issue. But if you let them run on the ground, you can lay down the landscape cloth and the water will still get through and uh, that worked pretty good. Uh, and the mulches help conserve water I know some people don't like to use plastic. It, it depends, you know, if you prefer to, an organic mulch, you can do that. One good weed is purslane, which is pretty common in our gardens here in Pennsylvania. And if you want to boost your omega-3 level, it has the highest of any leafy green vegetable. And it has a lot of good vitamins in it, um, carotenoids and a whole mess there, and a lot of good uh, minerals also. And uh, I usually pick some of that when it's, it usually comes out when it's uh, in, into July and August, but uh, when it gets hot, you know, you'll start, I start to see it in the garden and I'll put it on some salads or I'll just mix it in with some of the other vegetables. This is what it looks like. Kind of has a red stem and it, these leaves and it grows in clusters. So you, it'll start to spread out and uh, one good weed. Pest, insects are a problem. My biggest problems have been flea beetles, cabbage worms. I haven't had too many problems with aphids and some of the others, but depending upon where you are in the country, you can have a problem with them. So how do you control them? And I, I do not like to spray chemical insecticides or herbicides on my garden. Um, but my main strategy is to plant excess. Um, and because um, I know some of that's gonna get eaten by both the insects and damage and the critters. And so I always plant extra, even though, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about this uh, further, how I tend to control them. One of the things you can do to, is to try to prevent them. And you can do that by encouraging beneficial insects. And there's a whole group of them here that you can get, um, lace wings, parasitic wasps, damsel bugs. And also you can, Companion plant some flowers in there, cosmos and sunflowers, and some of these here will encourage these guys to come in and help reduce the, the uh, impact. But flea beetles have been my biggest problem. Uh, they, they, I cannot grow uh, um, no, trying to think here. They attack my potatoes, and usually what I do is I, I plant them up earlier. Uh, and uh, you can also use some sprays. Uh, there's neem oil, uh, hot pepper, pyrethrums, soapy water, and then the biologics, these parasitic rots. There's some nematodes you can also buy and incorporate in. Uh, one way you can minimize like uh, the flea beetles, uh, like eggplant, I had such a problem growing it. 
uh, is to use row covers. I bought some of this uh, agricultural row cover material. The light gets through, the water gets through, but it keeps the insects out. And I, I'm going to try that uh, on some of my plants this year. Like I said earlier, I, I time my planting. Some things I can plant earlier before they hatch. And sometimes you, you know, people, I use, I used to use rotenone uh, to, for flea beetles. I would dust my, and it's a rotenone is an organic material. I mean, it comes from a, uh, a plant, uh, but I came to find out that uh, that is a neurotoxicant, and uh, some people were seeing uh, Parkinson's-like syndromes uh, from it. So I quit using it. Uh, so it, just because it's organic does not absolutely mean it's safe. Uh, and and uh, you, if you take a look at the organic uh, standards, you would be surprised at um, what is considered organic. I mean, they allow you to use um, copper sulfate and copper uh, oxide and a whole, di whole different, there's sulfur compounds, there's a whole mess of different compounds that, that fall within the realm of organic. So you just need to be aware of that. Critters, these are the main ones. The deer, I have an electric fence. I, I uh, 5,000 volts is DC, so it's not going to kill you, but it gives you a good shock. Uh, and then uh, raccoons uh, and groundhogs have been my bane. I've been fighting them. Last year, I think I planted all that corn. I got two dozen ears and the raccoons got in there uh, about a week before it was ready to pick and they just decimated it. So uh, I'm going to add, uh, I have a lower wire there and I have a one inch, I had a one inch uh, white tape that I put down there to keep the raccoons out, but they are so smart they got through that. So I'm going to put two feet of chicken wire all the way around there and electrify that, and I'm hoping that'll work. Uh, but uh, you can you you can, a smaller garden is easy enough. You can put some kind of fencing on. Uh, you can use netting for the birds. Uh, I can't grow. I mean, I get so envious of people when I see their azaleas and their laurel bushes. Uh, they're fantastic. The deer were right on their walkway here between fields and they eat every leaf. And uh, I, I tried putting netting over them, but I have to leave it on so late in the spring. Uh, I ended up damaging the plants trying to pull the netting off. And I'm going to try the a row cover on uh, this year in the fall. Uh, you can also set traps and, uh, and you know, try to minimize them that way. This is an example of what that row cover looks like. Uh, in this application, it's, it's basically a floating row cover. They put it right over the plant. But you can also use wire hoops to stand it up off the plants if the plants are smaller and tender and, uh, and you weigh down the edges. Uh, garden orientation, you want it facing south for full sun. You want to make sure that your tar plants don't shade out the smaller ones. So you take a look at how the sun uh, comes across your your yard there where you're planting it. And there's a nice little app that kind of shows you it's uh, tied in with uh, uh, Google Maps. And uh, you can put your address in there and find your exact spot there. And it'll show you where the sun's going to rise in the morning, where it's going to set at night, and, and the angle uh, that it comes in. And it gives you a kind of an idea. Couple things about tomatoes and peppers. Blossom end rot is, is a problem. It's a common problem. And basically it's uh, an issue of getting calcium up to the plant. And there are two reasons why this happens because you don't have enough uh, lime in your soil or you're not watering regularly. Um, and um, irregular watering, this you can't get that calcium because it's not up there. On a regular basis, it can absorb it and bring it up. You can also get cracking in tomatoes with irregular watering. So you want to keep your, try to keep your watering consistent. And this is what it looks like. The ends of, uh, of the tomatoes and peppers will get this way from this calcium deposits. Tomato types, there's a couple main types. This, uh, one is called determinate. And this is a bush tomato. And so you want to know what, when you buy your tomatoes, you may not know, like if you buy them at a garden center, uh, you'll, you'll see a, a name like Aroma, but you may have to go online and try to determine whether it's a bush or it's an indeterminate. So uh, Aroma is a bush and it, it's going to grow to a certain height. And you really don't have to prune it much. 
Um, and I don't want to get into pruning, but you, it's a good idea to let the air get through your plants and get a little sunlight in them by doing pruning. And there's a lot of good videos online to show you how to do that. Uh, indeterminate tomatoes will continue to grow as long as conditions permit. So they will just go up, up, up and up as long as you can support them. Uh, San Marzanos are like this. And you, you, you need to prune them or they will get, they will get pretty wild. Uh, and if they outgrow your, your tops or your supports, then you can go ahead and just chop off the top and keep it from that way. Because they're going to fall over and break, break off themselves. So my future plans, I'm trying to move from till to no-till and um, uh, move away from chemical fertilizers. I'm still going to probably use some in a transition and, and try to go more organic. I'm going to build some big compost bins so they can really get into that. And um, I'm going to buy, uh, I'm going to start a, a, a uh, compost plot in, in the fall. I'm going to buy probably six or seven cubic yards and then, uh, and then amend them with the compost as time goes by. Uh, but I've been doing a lot of, of reading and, and watching some videos with Charles Dowding, Richard Perkins, Elaine Ingram, uh, all these people have some good videos and I'll send, I'll send you some links to some of them. And this guy from Brian from California TV, he's, he's very good too. Uh, but they're market gardeners, uh, the, at least these two guys are. And when you see their gardens, I mean, they are, it was just amazing. And they don't use much fertilizer. I mean, it's basically compost. They're growing it in compost. And he, when Richard Dow, or Charles Dowding uh, grew potatoes and he went in and harvested those potatoes, I have to plow mine with a tractor to bring them up. And uh, he just uh, pulled them out by hand and the potatoes were big and clean and the yields he got were just amazing in very small areas. So th this is the way I'm gonna go because it just seems to be, it's more efficient and, and, and there's much less weeding when you're using compost uh, because the seeds, the weed seeds have been killed. You can, you'll get some weeds that have been blown in and it's that, that first year, if you lay down that cardboard, it'll keep the weeds from growing up and then the others will be smothered out with compost as time goes by and you just put one or two inches on in the future. But these people have influenced me and I think that's the way I'm gonna move ahead. It just makes, this saves me some time pulling weeds. I can go ride my bike and go hiking in the mountains and do some other things. As much as I love gardening, I don't like pulling weeds too much. <clears throat> Supports. Uh, you want to try to keep the, the vines off the ground. When they're on the ground, uh, various things can get into them and they, they will rot faster. Staken is the most com common one that's been used. I like caging and I've done this uh, for the last several years. Uh, and the cages you buy in uh, Lowe's and different places like that are not very good. I mean, they're not very strong. Uh, and you get a good crop of tomatoes and they'll, they'll fold, uh, fold over. I bought rolls of this concrete, re concrete reinforcing wire. And in Lowe's, you can, you can pick up like a three or four foot section of it. They have it cut already and I make a cage out of that. But they are very robust cages and they will last for many, many years. Um, and uh, you can trellis them and, and trellising is a very good way to do it especially if you have like a raised bed um, the guy from California Garden TV he, he has a whole video on making trellises and how they work but most of the market gardeners trellis in, uh, their tomatoes in the greenhouses and it amazes me what they can support on a small string now here's an example of trellising here and they have a beam across there with, with the ropes coming down and the vines just kind of work their way up and then this is the concrete reinforcing wire that I was talking about. I just snipped the bottom of these uh, lateral all the way off and it left uh, like a, a six inch spike there that I could just push right into the ground and it holds them in place. Um, so that's all I have right now and um, that's what can be open for questions and comments at this point. Let me get back to Zoom here. Um, Phil, in the chat box, there's a couple questions. And one of them, if you can, can you see the chat box? Yeah. To... Yeah. Let's see, um, if you get rid of the UV light problem outside, you can start your seedlings without lights inside or in a greenhouse. Um, 
the UV light problem is more of a, an issue with hardening. I mean, when you, I started my seeds, I've direct seeded lots of things out in the garden and it's not a problem to do that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really see an issue there. I mean, if you have a greenhouse, that's fantastic. And that's one of the things that's on my to-do list is to build one of those, but uh, I haven't yet. Um, and there's a question here about using liquid fertilizer. Yes, people have done this. I mean, uh, I, I've seen these systems. They, they seem to work, uh, but I don't know anything about them. I've never tried them, and I don't, I don't have a recommendation for, for, uh, for any particular fertilizer. Uh, blight is a problem, and uh, there, there are some materials you can buy um, I remember a few years ago, there was a tremendous blight in Pennsylvania. There's some materials you can buy, and I don't re recollect the name of it right now, uh, but I did buy some and spray some on, on my tomatoes just to, as a preventative because the spores get up in the air and they, they, they blew in. But uh, you can spray. There's some things you can spray with that. And, uh, and I don't remember whether it was copper sulfate or what was in it. It's been too long. Uh, but uh, if you go uh, to Agway or, or some of the other uh, stores that carry uh, gardening stuff like that, um, there are some materials that you can spray. Uh, uh, try The only thing I can think of is if somebody has a question about harding off herb and flower seeds and they left out too long and they got pretty well dried up. The only thing I can do is just try to keep rehydrating them and see if you can bring them back. Uh, yeah, that can be a problem and you have to be careful with them. And uh, Edible flowers. Um, I haven't done too much with that. I'm a hibiscus I think are edible. Uh, I know I drink hibiscus tea, uh, but I, does anybody else else have a uh, comment uh, about edible flowers? I, I think nasturtiums. I'm trying to remember. I can't. I can't remember offhand. The Any flowers other? from squash. The when they flower, they're edible. Okay. Squash and zucchini. Okay. Well, have you heard about putting always putting a trellis on the north side of a raised bed? Uh, no, I, I have not heard that. Um, I, I think your, your trellis would be positioned on the long, the length of the bed. So if you have your bed oriented north to south, uh, and you're going to trellis, it depends how many plants you have. If you just have a small block of, uh, tomatoes, I understand that because then the, the sun would would still hit the other vegetables behind there first on the south side. And then when it finally got to the north, you wouldn't get shading. But yeah, that, I, I can understand why that would be the case if you did a block. If you have a long row of tomatoes in a, in a raised bed, then you're going to trellis all the way across. But I do like the idea of trellising. Uh, I grow so many tomatoes uh, that the cages seem to work better for me. But if I was doing a raised bed, I, I would definitely trellis. And I'll put a link in uh, to this California Garden TV, where he shows you how to build the trellises. Is it too late in the year to try to start new herb seeds? No, uh, you, can, you can start them now and they will grow. Uh, they may not get as big. I mean, I've got some, I started um, Greek basil and uh, uh, Italian basil and um, uh, oregano and uh, rosemary and some other things inside. But I'm also seeding, uh, uh, I put some arugula and some other stuff uh, outside now, and it'll grow. Uh, it may not get as big as you would uh, want, but it, it should, should be able to do that. It's not too late to do that now. You know, there was an earlier one from Lenora that you skipped about. She wants to know if you put cardboard down on Ray's bed. I don't know if you saw that. It depends on what your undersoil is. Uh, if you fill a raised bed with commercial soil that's been pasteurized to kill the weed seeds, then you probably don't need to do that. But if you use topsoil or some other soil that you've gotten that could potentially have weed seeds in it, then definitely you would wanna put 
uh, maybe fill the bed halfway with your topsoil because you wouldn't want to fill the whole thing with compost because it, 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 it's, it's pricey. Uh, if you, I mean, if you can afford to do that, you can do that. But if you filled half of it with topsoil and then put your cardboard down and then put eight or nine, uh, 10 inches of compost on top of that or your raised bed soil, which has been treated, then uh, that, would, that would work out for you. Uh, is it too late to plant lettuce and parsley seed? Uh, lettuce you can plant. I, I mean, I planted some lettuce yesterday. Uh, you, can, you can sequentially plant lettuce over the summer. The only problem you have with lettuce is, is it gets hotter, it's going to bolt. And so you, want, you may want to shade it. Uh, use one of these row covers to shade it. Uh, that helps. But uh, yeah, you can plant uh, uh, Parsley, I don't know. I planted, uh, started parsley in my uh, in the house here and planted those and they're doing good and I never planted outside from seed so I, I can't answer that. What is the what is the best when when is best to plant kale? Kale you can plant pretty early. I mean you can plant it like when you're doing spinach and some of those other cooler weather crops, but you can plant it now uh, and it'll grow. Uh, kale is very robust. Uh, I know the flea beetles like it a little bit, but boy, uh, it does really well for me. I've grown a lot of kale, and what I do is I take that kale uh, and I, I uh, strip the, the veins off of it, uh, the, the big main vein, and I put it in plastic bags, and I freeze it, and I, I'm, I'm just finishing up kale and Swiss chard from last year in, in my freezer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can grow a lot of it and then do that. Yes, uh, container gardening is a good way to go. Somebody talked about they're renting their home and they don't want to dig up the yard. And uh, can they just put the uh, uh, herb seeds in containers and leave them outside? You can. Uh, the, the only issue with container gardening is, is you've got to watch and keep it wet because they will dry out in a minute. And you, as you know, if you put flowers on your porch, you know you've got to be out there watering them almost every day. Uh, or you, you set up some sort of a drip irrigation system, then you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, you can, you can do that and it would not a problem. We grow nasturtiums in our garden to repel rabbits and eat the flowers. They have a peppery taste. Okay. I, I, I thought nasturtiums, I think I thought I mentioned that it was possibly one of them. I never heard of it being as a, I didn't remember, I listed it as one of the repellents there. Okay. Is it seems other, like, yeah, I was going to ask any other questions. I have a quick one. Where do you get your seeds? Is there any special area you recommend? Well, what I, uh, for some stuff, like when I plant corn, I, I'll plant uh, a half a pound at a time. So I have, I, I buy a half a pound of Silver Queen and a half a pound of uh, uh, some bicolor. And usually, them from Agway because they I can't go to some of the other places. Um, I ordered some seeds from Park Seeds. They were very good this year. I, bought, I got my San, San Marzanas from them and I was impressed with the germination rate that I had from them. It was almost like 99%. I mean, I, they really germinated well. But the rest of them I will buy at, at Lowe's or Walmart and uh, uh, yeah, unless it's something special. And uh, it, like, if you like to use some of the heirloom tomatoes and things like that, and then I would go to one of the other suppliers online and, and try to get some of them. Um, it, it's interesting to try the different tomato types. So uh, it's just amazing the taste and the variety of them that, uh, that we just don't get exposed to from the standard stuff in the grocery store. Okay, I think there's one more question which is from Gwen, and that is about the most economical option. I'm not ready to invest a lot of money in lighting to start. Yeah, I I, I would buy just buy the shop light. Uh, you can get them for for like 15 bucks or something like that up at Lowe's or Home Depot. And uh, like I say, the ballast may not last. You, you can spend 25 or 30, and, and they will last longer. But the, the, the most economical ones you can get for for 10 or 15 bucks. And uh, they'll hang, get two fluorescent tubes in them, and uh, that would be your most economical way to go. Wow, this has been fantastic, Phil. Uh, everybody, you'll know you'll get a link to the um, recording, and Phil's going to send you some information. 
And I think there's so many people who are saying thank you to you, Phil. It, it was really um, very informative. Well, thank you. I appreciate everybody uh, getting involved in gardening is such fun. I mean, I enjoy. Yeah, obviously you do. <laughs> okay, and you'll hear from me, everybody. You'll get emails about our next um, upcoming um, Zoom meetings, too. Thank you for participating. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Phil.